Bells Bells, it's NES Works episode 55. Behold the power and persistence of a joke. We all know Deadly Towers, because Deadly Towers is the worst NES game ever created. Unredeemable dreck, absolute bilge, indescribable excrement. Worse than Where's Waldo, worse than The Three Stooges, worse than those Muppet edutainment games, even worse than Color a Dinosaur, a game about coloring dinosaurs. It's not worse, it's worst. Deadly Towers is the absolute low point of the NES, right? Well, maybe not. Deadly Towers is not a great game. In fact, it's not even good. But it's absolutely not the worst thing ever to be inserted to America's collective Nintendo console, then collectively removed when America's collective screen flashed, then collectively blown on and collectively reinserted. Deadly Towers struggles to achieve even competence, but its failings have more to do with incredible ambitions and no real sense of how to realize those grand designs. Developer Linar, who we've already seen on Game Boy Works as the developer behind the extremely cool and inventive Mercenary Force, created what was without question the single largest NES game we've ever seen to date. Consisting of seven towers, ten dungeons, a connective overworld, and inexplicable parallel universes, the world of Deadly Towers spans more than 1,000 screens of video game. That's more than the entirety of The Legend of Zelda first and second quests combined. The thing is though, according to Giant Bomb, Deadly Towers was the very first game Lenar ever created. So this game is kind of like that kid who sits down with a copy of Minecraft and decides that for his very first creation, he should build a full-size replica of the Starship Enterprise, and then on its shuttle deck, build a working NES that plays Super Mario Bros. 3. Points for ambition, kid, but you gotta start small. Maybe build a tiny cubic house out of dirt or something first. But no, Lenar went big. And to be fair, Giant Bomb also claims Lenar was founded by a Namco veteran named Junichi Mizutari, who came by the whole Deadly Towers thing honestly. He had been the character programmer for that beloved landmark work, The Tower of Juraga. It's kind of tough not to look at the title Deadly Towers and think, dang, that's even more on the nose than Final Fantasy creator Hironobu Sakaguchi cranking out a game called The Last Story. But that's not really fair. Deadly Towers is strictly a US invention, a localization of the Japanese title Masho, which means Evil Bell. According to former Bruderbund employee Alan Weiss, the US publisher wanted to call it Hell's Bells, but Nintendo's strict anti-religious policies nixed that, though curiously not the crucifixes that lined the game's towers. So we got Deadly Towers, which is a wacky coincidence if ever there was one. As character programmer on Juraga, Mizutari was presumably responsible for making its hero Gilgamesh and the monsters he battled tick. The solid, steady feel of Juraga doesn't carry over here, though. Our hero, the hapless Prince Meyer, is a clumsy fellow, and the monsters who beset him are annoyingly random. Not only do monsters appear randomly, they also don't behave consistently from room to room. Sometimes two seemingly identical monsters will be insanely fast and soak up tons of damage on one screen, then plot along and fall to a few sword strikes on the next. It is a messy, sloppy, obtuse game. But it's not the worst game ever made for NES. The fact that it's widely regarded as such can be traced back more than 20 years to the works of one Sean Riley, aka Sean Baby, the man who basically invented being funny and being angry about video games on the internet. In the early days of the World Wide Web, when running a website was actually a pretty demanding process, Sean Baby ran one of the few and most notable sites about video games. Whereas most gaming sites that existed back in that era were focused on news, free ROM distribution, or just heaping praise on a single game or franchise, Sean Baby ran a site where he just made jokes about games. And his most enduring goof about video games was his top 20 worst NES games list, in which he ruthlessly mocked some of the jankiest and least enjoyable games on the system. Which, bear in mind, was still available for sale at retail at the time. Deadly Towers took the top, or I suppose bottom spot, and the joke stuck, being further cemented in the collective conscious more than a decade later when the angry video game nerd, whose shtick is basically Sean Baby Poindexter rather than punk rock, made similar observations. Of course, both Sean Riley and James Rolfe were exaggerating for humorous effect, but plenty of people have been content to take them at their word. And it's really not hard to understand why, because Deadly Towers makes itself hard to love, hard to play. Let's create a litany of basic game design sins that Deadly Towers commits. There's enough here that you could wallpaper a cathedral door with these complaints. Let's begin with just how fragile Prince Meyer is. Technically, I suppose he represents a step forward in game design from Juraga's Gilgamesh, who would die to a single enemy attack. 
Prince Meyer has hit points and can take a few hits before he dies. This shifts the balance of the game less in the player's favor than you might expect though because everything surrounding the prince is a big ol' heap of bullshit. For one thing, Meyer has no mercy invincibility when he's stuck. Take a hit while hemmed into a corner, and you can go from full health to dead in a second or two. Enemies tend to spawn randomly off screen and zip in to hit Meyer hard before the player has time to react. The game designers also had a habit of placing fixed enemy spawns right at the entrance to a room, so you practically can't avoid taking a hit as you transition into a new screen. To make matters worse, this constant vulnerability is paired with the worst collision knockback I've ever seen in a video game. Prince Meyer makes Simon Belmont look like a sure-footed bastion of stability by comparison. Taking damage will cause Prince Meyer to stagger backward several steps, during which time you have no control over him, but can still take more damage. And he doesn't recoil away from the direction he's struck, but rather backward from the direction he's facing, usually. Sometimes he staggers toward the bottom of the screen instead, no matter which way he's facing. This seems to mostly happen when he's standing near an active ledge, where staggering downward and falling equals instant fatality. And when you die no matter where you are, it's back to the very beginning of the game. You lose all your cash and all the expendable items you've acquired, keeping only permanent health ups and equipped gear upgrades. The dungeon design is bizarre here. The challenging portions are strangely front-loaded, with the entrance to the final boss's lair located on the opening screen immediately to the right of the passage to the bulk of the castle where the action is set. Meanwhile, the seven towers from which the game takes its name are located deep inside the castle, at the very back, accessed by passing through an insane gauntlet of narrow passages packed dense with spawning monsters and slippery ledges. They're so far in that most players probably never even see the towers. Once you reach the tower row, however, the game becomes weirdly tame. Each tower is set at the top of a series of stairs, and the ascent to and up each tower is by far the easiest aspect of the entire game. You have enough space and maneuverability in these spaces that you can take on most of the monsters here from a safe distance and not have to worry too much about survival. It's only when you reach the summit of a tower that you face a challenge in the form of the seven bosses that protect the bells that you need to collect and burn in order to face off against the Demon King Rubus. And even then the bosses are pretty easy to cheese. If you stand in the corner of the room and fire your sword beams diagonally, the bosses have a tough time hitting you with their magical fireball sprinkles. The tough part is just getting to the tower areas in the first place. The castle is ludicrously difficult, and it's made even more vexing by the presence of ten different dungeons whose entrances are completely hidden from view. You don't know where a dungeon is located until you accidentally stumble across the tile that warps you to the dungeon. And once inside, the dungeons sprawl across an 18 by 18 grid of monotonous rooms packed with monsters. There is a benefit to the dungeons. They contain shops where you can buy gear, upgrades, and expendable items, and these can be profoundly helpful when facing off against bosses. The problem is that the dungeons are jam-packed with hard-hitting foes in close quarters, and the layout design is haphazard and monotonous. Unless you take the time to meticulously map each dungeon's hundreds of rooms, you'll probably never find your way to the exit, which means all the goodies you purchased will be for nothing because you lose them when you die. A major portion of every dungeon experience involves finding a room where one of the blob chain enemies spawns, then constantly grinding for health refills and cash by killing that thing repeatedly. Top up your health in coffers, venture out, find a shop, return to the blob chain, repeat ad infinitum. There's almost a good game here. With major world editing and some fundamental tweaks to the core combat mechanics, Deadly Towers wouldn't be too terrible. And if you look at it in the context of its heritage, you can see how it ended up like it did. Deadly Towers was built very much in the shape of early Japanese Falcom PC action RPGs like Sorcerian, Dragon Slayer, and Xanadu. Trial and error and charting your way through harrowing, monotonous environments was a core facet of these games, as was all the randomness you encounter here, with the hidden entrances to inexplicable dungeons and parallel zones. Deadly Towers, when approached as a game that Japanese PC fanatics would have been struggling with and loving in 1985, makes a lot of sense. The tragic failing of Deadly Towers isn't that its design is inexplicable, it's that its inexplicable design seems incredibly archaic coming after the more modernized action RPG experiences that had sprung up on the NES in the months immediately preceding its American release. Deadly Towers hit the US a couple of months after Rygar, Kid Icarus, The Legend of Zelda, and Metroid, and it would be sandwiched by The Goonies 2 and Wizards and Warriors. All of these games approach the same concepts as Deadly Towers with vastly more polish and user-friendliness than Linar's freshman effort did. I'd like to wave this off by saying, hey, the game had predated all those releases in Japan, but actually it shipped in December 1986, which was nearly a year after Zelda's debut. 
So there's kind of no excuse except perhaps to say Linar badly misjudged what was acceptable and appealing on NES. Deadly Towers needed a massive overhaul to unleash the quite intriguing adventure that I think is hidden within, but instead we got a game that randomly and arbitrarily tends to kill players repeatedly within moments, a game where they were whisked away to impossibly vast mazes of monsters without warning. No wonder people think it's the worst game on NES. This might have been the best game on, say, the Sharp X1 in 1984, but on NES in 1987, we'd already seen how much better things could be. If you're looking for an improvement in terms of quality on the next episode of NES Works, well, brace yourselves, because it's a doubleheader of Micronics and Acclaim. Sorry. Sorry.